Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. We've been studying the book of Revelation for some time and now we're going to mainly study the book, the, the chapter 18. But I want to introduce that with reading the second angel's message of Revelation 14.8 from the Good News Bible. A second angel followed the first one saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. And then I want to turn to Revelation 18 and read verses 1 through 4. After this I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority, and his splendor brightened the whole earth. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the world grew rich from their unrestrained lust. Ken? Go ahead and read verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. You must not take part in her sins. You must not share in her punishment. Okay. Ken, why does this sound so much like, here in the first four verses of uh, Revelation 18, sound so much like the second angel's message? There must be a good reason. So let's see if we can find out what it is. We spent quite a long time talking about Revelation 17 because there's a lot of material there. And if you go back, you'll discover that Revelation 12, verses 13 to 17, sort of summarizes what happens between the death of Christ and what's called the time of the end, which Adventists believe began in the, in the year 1844. Then in chapter 13 and 14, we see the two opposing sides commenting about what's going to happen after that period of time, sort of summarizing again, really, you know, putting up their two sides and really nailing it down. And then we jump over to chapter 17, well, 15 and 16, of course, has, has um, the seven last plagues. Then 17 talks a lot of things. We'll review a little bit of that. And now 18, God is responding to some of the things that have been happening. And we're expanding once again even more on what we said in 12, 13, and uh, 12 and 13, and 14. So the genius of the book of Revelation is not to say that Christ is coming soon. A lot of people have said that. The genius of the book of Revelation, and I would add of Seventh-day Adventism, rightly understood, is that Christ is coming soon, but probably not as soon as we have thought. I mean, we have waited now since the Great Disappointment, which happened 169 years ago. There's something more important, and this will be really the key point of what we're going to try to say during this whole session together, there's something more important than the end itself, and that is the working out of the cosmic conflict. And let's, let's, let's be honest about this. God could have put his foot down or just done whatever he liked, wiped out the whole earth. He could have solved this whole mess instantly at any point, right? If that's theoretical. Theor theoretically. Because if God is love, mm -hmm. it, it, it couldn't happen that way. Yeah. Because God is love, you only could deal with people, intelligent creatures having the capacity to make choices. And we make our main point again, the ending must come in a way that resolves the issues raised in the cosmic conflict 
otherwise known as the Great Controversy. And what are those issues? Well, we're looking at some of them. Clearly, they have to be answers to the questions and allegations that Satan has made against God's character down through the generations. Way back from the time he started accusing God in the heavenly court in, in, in heaven, standing beside the, the throne of God, all the way down through every accusation that Satan has made has to be answers, answered. And the question for us really is, are we saying everything that needs to be said before Christ can come again? Well, look at Revelation 17. I said we would dip back into that. Look at Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17. The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. Now, a prostitute is a woman. And we've suggested that, that women in Revelation represent what? The church. the church. So here's an evil woman, right? They will take away everything she has and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and destroy her with fire. For God has placed in their hearts the will to carry out his purpose by acting together and giving the beast their power to rule until God's words come true. Now, there's a lot of contradictory kind of ideas in those two verses. When it says to carry out his purpose by giving of one mind and giving over there, is that God's purpose? Yes. Okay, it's God's purpose. God's pur that's part of God's letting Overall evil plan. demonstrate what it really is. How God it, said, it back, be. well, Satan has claimed all along that if, we, if, God, would, if, he, if God would step out of the way and let him take charge, things would be better. People would be able to do whatever they wanted to do. And God says, if we do that, the place will self-destruct. Yep. And so what happens at the end? God says, okay, now that I have cemented my people, Satan, you're, I'm going to give you a temporary time of almost full control. You can do whatever you want except, what? Destroy God's people. And this church, at one, at the, when it first started out telling us about it, it was pure. Mm -hmm. Then it went into the wilderness and came out the whore riding the dragon, riding the beast. Yep. Uh, and then finally, they're, they're, the, those that follow the beast, and the, they're, they're, they're through with it. They, they cast it aside. It says even they devour it, didn't it? Someplace yeah. Here. I mean, it's, it's really kind of done away with. But they, they've, used, they've used this church to mess up, pervert everything, uh, good and holy and righteous and everything. So how is that going to... I mean, can you interpret that in real language? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, <laughs> they had fornication. They, they, they got too close to the government. And the, the church got too close to the government, got too close to business. Got to, uh, they got messed up with false religions. Uh, you can yeah. put a lot of labels on the, on the false religions. Now, let's be clear. The, I, I, am, I, have, I used to think that the, the, this woman in Revelation referred to one particular church. Yeah. It's not true. It refers to all religion. And all religion has various kinds of problems. And I can tell you, well, I mean, I don't need to tell you, that religions have caused, down through the generations, religions have caused more war, religious disagreements have caused more wars and more bloodshed than any other thing that we could name. Just as one example of the mess that's been caused by a misunderstanding, a miscalculation, well, by Satan's efforts, yes. right? Well, what really astonishes me, though, is that Satan's going to turn on this woman. Mm -hmm. So it seems like a contradiction. Why would he do that? And he's going to do it. Yeah. I think it's a, a new kind of dominion. It's still a dominion, and there's mm -hmm. still an effect there, but it's mm -hmm. a new kind and much more broad, I think. Yeah. Satan is saying, I have been using these people for hundreds of years. They have served me well, but now as we're approaching the end, I can't trust them. They, they're not capable of doing everything I need to have done. I'm going to come and do it myself. Now, but this that, beast... That happens, though, with with her being destroyed. Mm -hmm. So he ha to do that, he's got to destroy them? Well, he turns people loose, and that's what, if you turn a bunch of Satan's followers loose on each other, that's what happens. 
And they don't believe in the Creator God. No. They, they, they believe in a God of their own uh, or somebody else's yeah. uh, fabrication, but they don't believe in the one infinite Creator God. No. So they, they, and they follow along. They, yeah. they're, they're, they're sheeple. But, but they turn, they, he turns them loose, okay? Mm -hmm. but, and they destroy themselves, but isn't that the whole point of the whole thing anyway? That even with Satan, yeah. he's going to destroy himself. So it himself. says at the end of those two verses we just read, what's going to happen? They're going to prove God's point. Satan is going to ultimately prove that God was right. By because, destroying Because he's going to behave just the way God said he's going to behave. Okay, now we come to Revelation 18.1. It's very interesting what it says here. Back in Revelation 13, we read that Satan is going to conduct some kind of a campaign and virtually everyone on this world is going to do what? Follow him. Worship him. Follow him. Revelation 13, 3, 4, 7, and 8. Now look at this, what's apparently going on at least during part of the same time. Revelation 18.1 says, he, uh, well, let's just actually read the words. Gordon read them for us. After this, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority, and his splendor brightened the whole earth. What's that talking about? Is this God's response to Satan's campaign? I mean, something that's going to brighten the whole earth, that's not something hidden in a closet somewhere, right? Some information is going to come out. Mm -hmm. And the whole earth is going to see it as if the light was shining on them. Now, we need to remind you that the book of Revelation is full of going back and forth between God's story and Satan's story. God's story, Satan's story. And we have stories that are inter intertwined and each one sort of depends on the other. Um, so it should be clear, I think, here from, from the messages that Gordon read us, that what we have here in Revelation 18 is an expansion on God's previous message back there in Revelation 14, right? Verse 8, this is the loud voice that's an expansion on the second angel's message. Now, uh, it's interesting where it says, then I heard another voice mm -hmm. from heaven. That's, mm -hmm. you know, we started out with Revelation at the beginning where he heard a voice saying, come up here, I want to see, and you'll see what's going to happen. Yeah. And now we're talking about another voice. Mm -hmm. Even after, after that, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, one possible reason for this repetition is that in, he in the Hebrew vocabulary, there are no comparatives or superlatives. There's no such thing as good, better, best. And the way you emphasize something is by repeating it. But this is written in Greek. This is written in Greek, but... Hebrew John Greek. is thinking in Hebrew. John is thinking in Hebrew, but he's writing in Greek. So you're saying that it, when it repeats, it's like saying most. Yes, or more at least. Or more. Yeah, usually two times is more and three times is most. Okay, that's, that's a characteristic of Hebrew. Mm -hmm. okay. And the whole earth is lighted with this splendor. How is that going to happen? I mean, this is not some, you know, like in a closet, as I've already said, this some somehow God's going to come forth and really, He's the light of God. How, how what's that? What's going to happen? As Gary said, this is information. Yeah. that's going to be given to us. And we might add, in light of the story of the Book of Revelation, this is the final call before the second coming. So why is Babylon fallen? Well, there are three things that are suggested. She's haunted with demons, number one. Number two, the nations have dr become drunk with her sexual immorality or the immoral lust. And three, the merchants of the world have grown rich from her unrestrained lust, a kind of exploitation and predation of the world's masses. And you can read about that in verses 11 through 13. Well, it almost sounds like it grossed itself out. Yeah. So that's why it fell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, even back in the first angel's message, we learned th the question is who's supposed to be worshipped? Now, Revelation 13 says the whole world is going to worship who? The beast. The beast and the dragon that gave the beast its power. 
Revelation 14, we get to verses 6 and 7, says we should worship who? Honor God, worship Him, and praise His greatness. So here's our two sides again. So every one of these three angels' messages has a counterpoint message and opposing views. See if we can think about it. The, the term beast, can that be applied also to the dragon? Yes. Okay, so... The so dragon is a beast. I understand. That, that's what I figured. So uh, here we got uh, up in chapter 18, it says the, the, the beast, because it was, is not, and is to come. And it talks about the, the eighth one, which was one of the seven, mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. Well, if the first beast was the dragon, mm -hmm. and, and then the eighth, be, the eighth beast will be the dragon. He's behind all the others. Yeah. So, they, it, that's, so that when it says here in, in, in verse 16 of chapter 17, mm -hmm. the beast will hate the harlot, uh, the, the beast is, Satan has been trying to, he has been using and trying to, uh, and abusing the, the church. So. Mm -hmm. Well, even the prophet is called a beast, isn't it? I think I read The false that. prophet? The false prophet. False prophet. That, that's the, that's the lamb-like beast. The lamb-like beast, yeah. So you, you got the image also, it's almost like there's three items here, just like there's three items of God, God, the Father, Son, mm -hmm. Spirit. Exactly. There's, there's the same thing happening on that end, too. Okay. Look at a very, in support of your idea, Jim, look at Revelation 12, verse 3. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of his heads, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, jump over and look at chapter 17, verse 3. The Spirit took control of me, and an angel carried me to a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Scarlet beast. red or scarlet beast. Is that the same one from Revelation 12, verse 3? Absolutely. That had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. It's the same beast. This woman who went away as a pure woman into the wilderness was helped by God to escape from the devil as now coming back riding on the devil. Something changed. Something horribly changed. Okay? So we must absolutely keep in mind that all the time there's two sides here and the devil is in a desperate struggle to make his point as strong as he can to try to keep up with God. So in these, in here, what, what have we learned? Well, is this the first time, these two places that Gordon read to us, are those the first times in the Bible where, when it, there's a suggestion that Babylon has fallen? There's Old Testament references. To Lots of Old Testament references. Isaiah 21, 9, Jeremiah 51, 8. Just look at Jeremiah 51, 8, for example. Babylonia has suddenly fallen and is destroyed. Mourn over it. Get medicine for its wounds, and perhaps it can be healed. Foreigners living there said, We tried to help Babylonia, but it was too late. Let's leave her now and go back home. God has punished Babylonia with all his might and has destroyed it completely. So this isn't the first time we've talked about Babylon falling. So we're going to suggest that Babylon is the vehicle for the demonic. Babylon is the vehicle for the demonic. And what's the message of the demonic? If, if the devil were to speak the truth about himself and correctly represent his character, how many people do you think would worship it? Close to zero. If you walked, even walked, I mean, walked out on the street here, I mean, and you asked people, how would you like to worship Satan, even as little as they know, virtually everybody would say no, right? But there is something that's very attractive about Babylon, no matter what you say. That's power. Mm -hmm. Power gets things done. Power is what people use to, to conquer people with and to lord it over people. And it's, it, people go after it right now. So we have learned that the, the demonic is doing its very best to misrepresent God, trying to pull God down, in other words, and to deceive everyone dwelling on this earth and we've already mentioned Revelation 13, 3 and 4, and 7 and 8, where it says, everyone worshiped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. There's the power you're talking about. The they worshiped the devil. At the end of our world's history, I mean, you know, I, I have to sort of shake myself. 
is it really possible that at the end of our world's history, the whole world, in effect, is going to be worshiping the devil? You know, th there is something with, with Babylon, though. Uh, we keep looking at it as, as the woman, the harlot. But it is a city. Mm -hmm. It is a city. And so symbolically, you can look at it as a city also because it's going to be burning pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And people are going to be watching it burn. So what is this immorality that is infecting Babylon? We're talking about a church. We're talking about a woman who should be faithful to whom? God. God, right? Well, actually, and she is isn't not. It like, isn't it like us? We're supposed to be faithful now, to God. Now, come on. Let's not get too personal here. I mean, <laughs> I mean we're, we're trying to be faithful to God. Yeah. That's, that's the normal, like being perfectly married and all that. Mm -hmm. But you've got this other woman here that people have turned from God and they're going after her. Yeah. And yeah. so, false they, kind they, of the picture they, they there. They think she's more fun. False concepts of God. Yeah. You, could, you, you really don't have to do this or don't have to do that. You can just... Uh, are there any religious organizations existing in our world today that are completely taken over by the misrepresentations of God pr produced by the devil? Completely taken. Well, let's 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 not mention any by name, but just think about it. What I mean, how many of how many organizations don't limit yourself to one religion even? Well, they're, if they're not telling the truth about God, or even if they have some truth there, if they're if they're deceiving, they're, they're it's yeah. deadly. I mean, the deception is is ultimately deadly. If they know they're deceptive. Well, even if they, even if they don't know. There's a lot of press, you know, people that are in that church that think it's completely true. Mm -hmm. I think you can so, say there's a lot of influences across the board, just about yes. everywhere. I mm -hmm. believe all religions, uh, to varying degrees, are infected. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a deadly infection, like yes. HIV is yeah. a deadly infection. The counterfeit that's the hardest to differentiate from the real is one that has a lot of truth in it. Mm -hmm. right? Very close. So here we have a, a predatory system. It's not only predatory in terms of corrupting and misrepresenting God spiritually, but it's economically predatory and exploitative. So we have three indictments against this false church. The first two of which are primarily spiritual, and the third of which is economic and political. So what does the represent, woman represent in the broadest possible sense? All religion. The beast, on the other hand, represents the state or politics. Is the Bible interested in the broad framework of human existence? Does the Bible care about what happens to us? Well, surely, surely we should be able to answer that. Sure. Absolutely. And here we have, we just read Revelation 17, 16, the ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will take away everything she has and leave her naked. Does this mean that as we come close to the end of the, this earth's history, people are going to abandon the church completely? Do we see that happening around the world? I think it's going to touch all facets of our life. Yeah. All of them. And there'll still be some religion somewhere. That I'm really yeah. Sure. Well, what do you mean by, by leaving the church? Are you talking well, about... Well, shall I, shall I mention the country of England? So, um, yeah, what percentage of the English people? England used to be the, the, the light of the world. The bastion of, the bastion of Christianity. Yeah. But we're talking about the prostitute here. Yeah. And yeah. so she, if they're leaving the prostitute, isn't that good? Well, but hold on. That was the time it was a bastion of Christianity was hundreds of years ago. And now what's happened? It's I mean, there's what, 5% of uh, Brit Brits that go to church ever? Apathy. Uh, and that's pretty irregular a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. So our pioneer, who we are Seventh-day Adventist, Ellen White, said this is a story, talking about the collusion between the beast and the woman, this is a, the, this is a story of statecraft and churchcraft. Her words actually say, the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft as represented by the iron and the clay, and that's of course talking about the feet of the, of the image in Daniel 2. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. 
He said that in Manuscript 63 of 1899. Practicing, we don't, doings? Yeah, doing activities, things. yeah. So the book of Revelation, we don't have to go back to Daniel 2. The book of Revelation is very clear that the church and state are cooperating almost every possible way. A major part of the statecraft is economic exploitation and predation. God is calling for a prophetic critique, and shouldn't that be us, of Satan's entire system which is trying to dominate the world? How well are we doing as individuals, as local communities, as, as a church, pointing out the devil's evil effects on this world? And many, even theologians, say they don't believe there is a Satan. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's just fo focus for a moment on the economic issues involved here. Look at Revelation eleven eighteen. The time has come to, and I'm reading the last half of it, the time has come to reward your servants, the prophets, and all your people, all who have reverence for you, great and small alike. The time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. What do you think that's talking about? Well, compare Revelation 18, 13. Well, destroy the earth. That isn't necessarily talking about the dirt. That's talking mm -hmm. about everything to yeah. do with it. With it. So it's, it's a pretty broad. Sure, sure, sure. If you, leave, if you read Revelation 18 and you start from verse 11, you talk about the merchants of the earth and talk about all their buying and selling. It all sounds pretty normal until all of a sudden you get down to the end of verse 13. It says, and slaves and even human lives. What kind of a what kind of a system is that? Pretty evil, right? Mm -hmm. So in these four angels' messages, we see that Babylon is first indicted on a spiritual basis, but it is followed by a scathing indictment on a socioeconomic basis. This is a severe critique of Satan's whole system. In other words, Satan is producing a whole lot of people just like himself who are selfish to the core, right? I mean, look at... Look at 9-11. What, what, what happened then? Look at the economic collapse of 2008. Weren't, the, weren't these a res, direct result of animosity and greed? Okay, we're going to take turn later to another example that occurred earlier in history, the French Revolution. In that context, God calls for us to leave, or, well, in this context, God calls for us to leave Babylon, Babylon so we do not take part in her sins or her plagues. God is bringing a day of accountability. The call to leave Babylon is a call in two senses, a spiritual sense, then a socioeconomic sense. How are we to do that? God says, come out of her, my people. Uh, does that ring any bells with you? Who does God call his people? Well, Israel of old, wasn't it? Lots and lots of references to my people. So who do you think is God calling, calling my people at the end here? All of us. The ones that follow him as... Maybe the ones that he puts his stamp on? Right. Who are the people who are sealed? Do you remember? Uh, at this very time in history, there's a sealing going on, and, and I quote from Ellen White. This is in Manuscript 173, written in 1902. And it's quoted, the easiest place to find it is in volume 4 of the Bible Commentary, page 1161, paragraph 6. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen by human eyes, we might add, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so that they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come.
Welcome. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We've been talking about Revelation 18. And if you're interested in the handouts that we use to try to pull our thoughts together, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You're welcome to anything that's on that site. Use it to your best ability and to your best usefulness in any way. We were talking about what kind of people are God's true people. And that reminds us that we're not talking about single individuals now. We're talking about a corporate group. And this is a corporate notion of redemption. We in Western thinking have a little hard time with corporate redemption, but God is calling for a people to stand out for something they really believe and to be protected from something. They're going to be protected from the destruction of the devil, but they're going to stand very strongly for the truth about God as they understand it. We're being called to stand up for and correctly represent God's character, and that's what Paul did. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Imitate me, Paul said, then, just as I imitate Christ. Are we to that point? Would we dare to say something like what Paul said? Isn't, doesn't God need that kind of people at the end of this world's history? Yes. Remember that the issue in the great controversy is the cosmic conflict over God's character. So turn now to Revelation 18.6. It says, treat her, this is talking about Babylon, as she has treated you. Pay her back double for all she has done. Fill her cup with a drink twice as strong as the drink she prepared for you. Is this the Lex Talionis in action? What's Lex Talionis from the Old Testament? Do you remember what? An eye and a tooth for a tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Exodus 21, 24, Leviticus 24, 20, and Deuteronomy 19, 21. What you do to me, I'll do to you. Yeah, exactly. But this one is worse. <laughs> double, you do mean. Worse, yeah. why, why is this double? It's, it's possible that considering the Hebrew forms of thought, this is just a way of saying it's certainly going to happen. A way of emphasizing. So who's doing it? And here we're coming to the real crux of the matter. Who is doing this to Babylon? Well, look at Revelation 18, 7 and the last part of the verse. She tells herself, Here I sit a queen. I am no widow. I will never know grief. Okay? That's what this woman who is now a part of Satan's kingdom is saying about herself, right? That's taken straight away from the Old Testament, Isaiah 47. There are many allusions to the, in, to the Old Testament in Revelation 18, many of them. So Isaiah, how does that answer which, who's doing it? Well, oh, 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 hold on here. You're getting, You're getting there. Yeah. So, there, this is, in other words, this is not a new idea. Notice very interesting that it says, She will be burned with fire because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. Revelation 18, 8. And that's also what it says in Isaiah 47, 7 and 9. Notice it's in the passive tense. She will be burned with fire. Does that tell us who's doing it? No. It doesn't. A lot of, there's a lot of statements in the book of Revelation that are in the passive verse, voice. And then we have to try, try to figure out from the context who is actually doing it. Um, but in Revelation 17 and 18, chapters 17 and 18 now, the subjects are often very explicit. It's, it's coming right out and starting to say things. We have suggested that Revelation 18.8 is a recapitulation of Revelation 17.6. And what did Revelation 17.6 say? I'm saying 17.16. Who's destroying the prostitute? The beast. Well, her, her buddies, right? Yep. It's people in, from Satan's side. So who's destroying her in Revelation 18.8? Satan. I mean, it can't be a bunch of different people destroying her. It's mm -hmm. people from her own side that are still destroying her. The ten kings, ten horns, will hate the whore and will burn her with fire from Revelation 17. Isn't that the same idea being given here in the active voice? When we have an active voice, do we know who, is, who the subject is? Absolutely. The active agent here is the beast and the ten horns, right? This is God's judgment. So God comes down with his blowtorch and he starts burning people up, right? No. No? 
There is retribution, but the retribution is not from God. It plays itself out inside the camp of the opposition. Theologically, this is by far the most important point in Revelation 17 and 18, by far. So, so state that most important point again then. Okay, so the point is that God is eventually going to give Satan enough rope so he can hang himself. Is that a way to put that? The, the people who are on Satan's side are so selfish that they're gonna, there's going to come to a time when they're actually fighting, fighting against each other and trying to destroy each other. It kind of infers that in the end of five, and, and God has remembered her iniquities. Yeah. So it's a bit like yep. Job. He's standing back mm -hmm. and having a go at it. Now, now, the only thing is that we know in Revelation it says God is what? It's a consuming fire. That was in Hebrews. Now, okay, in Hebrews, okay, this is... But it says here, she will be consumed by fire. Yeah. That's so that would almost transfer to God doing it too. Well, that's a possibility. But there's nothing back, there's nothing here that says we, we need to go back to the book of Hebrews. What it does say here is that it sounds like it's referring back in just a few verses earlier from the previous chapter that says who's doing it? Her buddies are doing it. Yeah, but Revelation is a bunch of symbols that you get the you get the uh, meaning of the symbols from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when you get consuming, consuming fire, that's just one of the symbols to me. Yeah, anyway. the church, church is referred to as the woman or the, and referred to as she and so forth. Yeah. And now this harlot, which we say was the church, and now we got the city, which is Babylon, is her and she. Are they all just all mixed? It, 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 you can't, really can't differentiate? They're A lot all, of different symbols for the same thing, yeah. Yeah. But it does it does kind of remind me of the book of Esther when the bad guy gets hung by his own gallows. Yep. And it's kind of like this is kind of painting that picture. Very much like that. Then follow two laments on the kings of the earth. Let's read them for, for a moment. Revelation 18, 9 and 10. The kings of the earth who took part in her immorality and lust will cry and weep over the city when they see the smoke from the flames that consume her. Now, why would they be crying and weeping over her? They're next. <laughs> they're losing they're, power. <laughs> they're losing power. They're losing wealth. They stand a long way off because they are afraid of sharing in her suffering. They're not over there to help trying to rescue her, are they? They say, how terrible, how awful, this great and mighty city of Babylon. In just one hour you have been punished. And then there's another lament. The merchants of the earth. Now also cry and mourn for her because no one buys their gold, their goods any longer. No one buys their gold, silver, and da 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 da. A long list of goods, and then we come to that end of the that sentence: slaves and even human lives. The merchants say to her, "All the good things you longed to own have disappeared, and all your wealth and glamour are gone, and you'll never find them again." Wow. You know, this is this is the part in this chapter that kind of mystifies me. I don't quite understand. It, there was a command for everybody to leave. To leave. To exit. To get out. Mm -hmm. Now all these merchants and everything, they're outside. They're watching from a distance. So they are part of the group that are on the outside. Yeah, well, well not far I, enough out. <laughs> well, I know, but um, there's something there. Out. There's something there that... Um, hasn't quite been yeah. figured out, I think. And then there follows a third lament by the economic powers who seem to have gained a lot of advantage to their previous cooperation. Look at Revelation 18, 15 through 17. And the merchants who became rich from doing business in that city will stand a long way off because they are afraid of sharing in her suffering. They will cry and mourn and say how terrible, how awful for the great city. She used to dress herself in linen and purple and scarlet and cover herself with gold ornaments, precious stones and pearls. And in one hour she has lost all her wealth. All the ship's captains and passengers, the sailors and all others, who earned their living on the sea, stood a long way off, and cried as they saw the smoke from the flames that consumed her. There never has been another city like this great city, and so forth. Are we to take, like in verse 8, it says the single day she got all the plagues. It looks like that's a worldwide calamity. Now we've got here single hour, so that's mm -hmm. got to be prophetic too, interrelated. Well, that's a, uh, that's a fair question. I can tell you that uh, I know of one person who spent a lot of time studying that and concluded that 
the reason it sometimes says one day and sometimes says one hour, his conclusion was Satan asks for a whole year, which would be the day, a prophetic time, to have control of this earth, to try to gain his ways and prove that he's the Lord of this earth. And God says, no, but I will give you a couple of weeks, which would be the half hour. Yeah. Yeah. That's one possibility. Mm. So economic collapse. The Roman Empire was at its peak, its zenith, its most extensive and powerful time in the second century AD, approximately 100 years after the writing of the book of Revelation, especially under the emperors Trajan and Hadrian. Remember that Hadrian's wall is located where? England. Central, Central England. England. Yeah, still there. Yeah. And the Romans were all the way over in Persia. Babylon and Persia. Persia. Clear over there. So Rome was in control of that whole swath of the world. So they extended Roman power all the way from England to Persia. There seems to be a temporary... So then, there seems... Look at Revelation 18, 20. Be glad, heaven, because of her destruction. Be glad, God's people, and the apostles and prophets for God has condemned her for what she did to you. So God's people, apparently, at least temporarily, are going to take a breath of fresh air, Right? Then there is a symbolic action in verses 21 and 23. Look at that for a moment. Then a mighty angel picked up a stone the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea. Now, is this a literal stone? That's a point. Saying, this is how the great city Babylon will be violent and thrown down and will never be seen again. If you take a huge stone and you throw it out way out in the ocean, what are the chances you're going to find it ever again? The music of harps and of human voices, of players of the flute and trumpet will never be heard in you again, and so forth, down to verse 23. Never again will the light of a lamp be seen in you. No more will the voice of brides and grooms be heard in you. Your merchants were the most powerful in all the world, and with your false magic you deceived all the peoples of the world. Is that talking about Revelation 13, deceiving the whole world? Hmm? Well, what? The deceiver of the whole world is Revelation 12. Yeah, also. yeah. But even Revelation 13 yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. So once again, we see a, a great sense of ending. Notice this. The music of harps and of human voices uh, will never be heard again. Of players of the flutes and of the trumpet will ever be heard, found in you again. No workman in Indian trade uh, will be heard. No, uh, no workman in Indian trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of the millstone will be heard no more. Will the harp of the, never again will the light of a lamp be seen in you? No more will the voice of the brides and grooms be heard in you. So first there's an end of culture, then the end of production and industry, and the light of the lamp no more, even bridegroom and bride no more. Human civilization is coming unglued, scaled back, coming apart, and these are all Old Testament allusions, especially from Jeremiah. So finally, in conclusion, but still in the passive voice, we come to verse 24, Babylon was punished because the blood of prophets and of God's people was found in the city. Yes, the blood of all those who have been killed on earth. Now, why is that important? We talked about this back in earlier in the book of Revelation. Many of our Christian friends want to suggest that everything that's in the book of Revelation is really talking about events which, is ha which happened way back in John's day, that not even God himself can predict the future. So this can't be a prediction of anything in the future. It has to be back then. Well, there's no way that you can make Babylon responsible for the death of all those who have been killed for their religious beliefs down through the centuries. Just can't be did, as my mother used to say. Or Rome either. <laughs> or Rome either. Notice there's no way that this blood of the prophets and of God's people could be limited to imperial Rome. We cannot possibly blame imperial Rome for everyone who has been killed in the name of religion. So another reason why we believe this is a prediction of things far into the future, coming down all the way to our day. You're, so, you're saying that this is, this is too uh, complete to be back then. Yeah, well, exactly. we're saying, if you're saying, I'm saying you're Babylon now, just temporarily say you're responsible. I'm saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're Imperial Rome mm -hmm. in the days of John. There's no way I can blame you for the death of everyone down through the ages who's been killed in the name of religion. 
just not possible. Mm-hmm. No. So the law of lex talionis, which means what again? Eye for an eye. Tooth for tooth. Catches up with Babylon. But God is clearly not the execution of this indictment. Babylon has blood on its hands. Now, let's now review some of the symbols. As we have suggested, the woman represents the church or religion, right? We're talking about worldwide, all religions. Two, the beast represents politics or the state, including political or military power. Three, Babylon represents the centralized imperial power in its early history and later a cooperation between the church and the state. Revelation 13. The beast from the sea represents a composite of imperial powers, the last of which was Rome. Five, it includes a sort of predatory economic system, and we just talked about that a little bit. All of this is foreshadowed already in the Old Testament. So, in this imperial Roman thing that people want to make the book of Revelation all about, what's an emperor? What defines an emperor? Holding to nobody but himself. Absolutely. You remember the famous painting, and I should, I have a picture of it. I should have brought it with me. What did, what did Napoleon do when he declared himself emperor? Put the crown he on took his He took the crown from the church leader and picked it up and put it on his own head. A very famous painting. So the basic essence of an emperor is that he is answerable to no one. So if one is an emperor, it does not matter whether he has any consent. He doesn't have to get, win anybody's votes. He doesn't, doesn't have to win any elections. He is absolutely powerful and no one can question him. There was a Catholic philosopher, scholar, who was on the staff at Cambridge University back in the late 1800s, who commented a lot on many of these huge societal issues. And he made a famous statement that I, I'm sure all of you must have heard in a letter he wrote to a friend. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Does that sound anything like what's happening on the opposition side here in the book of Revelation? Great men are bad men? Well, in terms of the world, if you look at the people who wanted to make a huge name for themselves... From looking from that angle in the world. We've seen it in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. World World War II uh, to the present day. Mm -hmm. So, let's talk about this now. What's the fault of of this system we've been talking about? The woman riding on the beast and so forth. What's wrong with that? Um, she's kind of a housebreaker, isn't that right? Okay. I mean, if you're and what does that married, mean? If you're happily married, and she comes and seduces the husband away to break the house. Well, but yeah, and that's true. But what we have here is the religious power, the political power, the military power, all in total, complete collusion, right? And that's the way things used to be in ancient times. Power was concentrated in the hands of a few individuals, often even into one person's hands. There was an emperor of Rome. There was Alexander the Great for Greece. There was in Go Back, you know. There was no balance, concentration of power. By contrast, what does God say is supposed to be the way power is distributed? Is always supposed to be in the hands of one person? In the Old Testament, what was the what was the pattern in the Old Testament? It was shared. It was broken down and shared in sort of who, tears. Who had the religious authority? Levites. The Levites. It was a tribal thing. It was the Levites who had who was supposed to be the king? Were supposed to be the kings? Judah. And then there was an outlier who came on the scene every once in a while, called a prophet. What tribe did he come from? Any tribe. Any tribe. And when the other two Groups got out of line a little bit. God would send one of these prophets in. So God intended for what? A distribution of authority and with different. I mean, you even go back to the book of Judges. And what do you see in the book of Judges? The people who became judges, were they uh, 
from some kind of royal line? No. No. They were, they were your guy that lived next door, you know, who happened to have a set of skills maybe as a, as a, as a military leader or something, and they would say, here, you lead us. Let, we, need to, we need to get rid of these evil people that are lording it over us, and that's what they did. Where, where does Melchizedek fit then? Well, that's a very special case because that applies to Jesus and, and, and so forth, yeah. But, uh, He's a great high priest that yeah. has everything coming together yeah. and unto him, which yeah. he's worthy to be. Can you think of a, a one individual in the Old Testament who sort of tried to pull all those things together and control everything just himself? The rebel okay. king Jeroboam. The rebel king Jeroboam in, in First Kings. Chapter 13, 14 in there, 12, 13, 14. So, what's, what, what's wrong with that? What happened? Remember, God sent a prophet and said, you are not doing right. He was trying to, he was acting like a Levite, wasn't he? He was acting like a high priest himself. He was there uh, trying to offer the sacrifices on the, on the altar. And he said, would you like to be a priest? Would you like to, be? okay, you join my payroll. You can be a priest over here. You, you go over there. You can be a priest over there. He controlled everything. And when that happens, what, what, what's the role of the average person out in the community? What authority do they have? Subjugation. And, I mean, look at, the, look at the pyramids. You work as hard as, can, as you can under the lash of a whip, and who gets, who gets more wealthy and, and, and more elevated? Pharaoh. The Pharaoh. You work hard and the Pharaoh gets rich. And what happens to you? You just keep on working hard until you can't do it anymore, right? And you get nothing. So, thinking of the context here, what is the acid test for liberty? The same one who talked about power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. What did he say? He says, the most certain test by which we judge whether a country is really free is the amount of security enjoyed by minorities. Security enjoyed by minorities. Democracy isn't a perfect system. Yeah, you probably all know the famous statement from Winston Churchill, democracy is the very worst kind of government except for all the others. <laughs> So, in, in, in a, in a constitution, well, we have what kind of a democracy do we have here? Constitutional republic. A constitutional democracy or a republic. And why do we have that kind of constitutional republic? It's supposed to put limits on the government, on the power. There are some, and it does. Yeah. There are, you, we could have a system that says if 50% plus one person votes for something, we do it, no matter how crazy it is. That's mob rule. That's mob rule. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, well, that's what yeah. democracy is, is mob rule. Yeah. Well, but... 51% so, over 49 or, or yeah. fraction thereof. But we, our Constitution says for some things you have to have 66% or 75%. And what's the purpose of that? To try and to keep us from going crazy altogether at the same time. Well, and you, you don't have the rapid pendulum swings one way or the other, so it, you, it, life is more predictable. You can look, project downstream what, how th things will be. So let's look and see what the great uh, reformers, for example, have done in the past. John Calvin fled France, went to Geneva, Switzerland, started a church there, became so popular that they elected him mayor of the city. And what did he do? Well, there was a certain physician who was also a theologian by the name of Michael Servetus who came to Geneva because he thought this would be a good place to, 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 to practice his religion safely and so forth. And what happened to him? Burned at the stake. He got burned at the stake because John Calvin, the great reformer, said, we can't tolerate someone who doesn't believe exactly like we do. Servetus was an Arian. He believed that Jesus is the son of the eternal God, but he did not believe that Jesus was the eternal son of God, and John Calvin burned him at the stake. Um, there's other stories so of, of, of something similar. I think originally when people came over to the, to 
to the new country, they wanted to establish their religion there so that they could do the persecuting. Yeah. It wasn't until I tried to unite them together when the idea came that, you know what, maybe we can all live together here and, and have a government where everybody can have their own religion. That, it was only after that that, that okay. came. And in our country, who was it that championed religious freedom? Williams. Roger Williams, who founded Rhode Island. And the capital is called Providence. Providence. How nice. Well, unfortunately, even Protestants held that certain doctrines were more important than religious liberty. Okay. So the breaking point in, in Protestant, Protestantism, really, the breaking point in which it stands or falls is how do we treat those who disagree with us? Now, and even on religious matters, whatever good the Protestants may have done, it was canceled out if they coerced belief. And that's exactly what Roger Williams said. If you coerce people, if you force them to accept your beliefs, then neither liberty nor the doctrine really matter very much. Um, in ancient times, uh, Constantine, that we look back to, started to became made Christianity the official religion of the church, I mean of the, of the Roman Empire, had a statue built of himself as Apollo, the pagan god, and on top of it was a crown, and in the crown were three nails his mother brought from, from Palestine that were supposed to be the nails that Jesus, that nailed Jesus to the cross. I mean, what did Constantine think? He thought that religion was an opportunity to enforce his political power and his political strength through the, through the church. So and let's... What, what have we learned in Revelation 18 about God? Well, in Revelation 18 here, in the last few seconds we have, we've seen that God at the end doesn't jump in and, you know, bash people's heads or anything like this. He stands back and he allows Satan, the people on Satan's side, to destroy each other. It's Satan's doing. And that's how it comes to an end. See you again next week.